John chapter 13 and 14 this morning, we see a pattern developing uh, where the Lord answers some uh, questions, some cares, and concerns with those who are his closest followers. These were the, the disciples. These were the ones who would be the apostles of the New Testament church. And these are the guys that he had, you know, had, who had walked with him for the last so many years and, who, and had, uh, he had uh, modeled for them the, the walk in the life of Jesus Christ. But here in uh, uh, 13, 31 to 35, Jesus announces his departure in the, the ending part of uh, chapter uh, uh, 13. He tells them in verse 31, Now the Son of Man uh, glorified, and his Father glorified in him. And you can kind of think, that, hey, what, is, what does this glorification mean? What does this glorifying uh, mean? And it's, it, it's my time, he tells them. My desire, uh, my divine appointment with the cross will bring me glory in all of this. And you can kind of think, wow, amazing. Uh, this sentence of death that he's speaking about, shameful and as, uh, and, uh, as, as heinous as it would be, uh, would bring glory to the Son and glory to the Father. See, Jesus has other uh, uh, ways of thinking that, hey, I'm going to be glorified. When you think that you'd be glorified, hey, you might win some award, you might win some presentation, you might be the queen of the ball, or you might be the one in back of the convertible way, giving your Miss Aloha wave, you know, to the crowd and stuff like that. Whatever it might be, you can kind of think that, hey, that's, that, that would be my thought of being glorified. But his thing of being glorified, his thought of being glorified was his appointment uh, on the cross. He says, I am with you a little longer, he's telling his uh, uh, disciples. Where I am going, you cannot come. But uh, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And uh, in verses 36 and 37, Peter sternly questions Jesus about not following along with him right now. Jesus, uh, Peter says, hey, why can't we come? I want to come right now with you. You know, what's up with this? Uh, uh, he makes his claims about his commitment and loyalty to the Lord. Yet here Jesus speaks of Peter's denial of him. And we see at times our own frailties through the lives of others like Peter, guys. And, you know, we, we can think that Peter was so destroyed in his heart. He was so crushed uh, that, uh, that he did end up denying the Lord. At, 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 the, uh, at his denial, the cock crowed three times and he... He, he went away, he wept bitterly because he knew what he had, uh, he had claimed that I would never leave you, Lord, I would never deny you. And yet he failed so miserably. And at times we might think like Peter, hey, we might not de de deny the Lord, but in other areas we could really fail him miserably also. And, and in that we can see, you know, uh, the love of uh, Jesus Christ. At the end of uh, John's gospel, he, sa he says, Peter, when you return, feed my sheep. Tend my lambs, feed my lambs, and you know it's a call. He says, "Hey, when you when you when you come out of this state, out of this funk, out of this bad feeling that you have, and the condemnation, the conviction, the enemy jumping on you, you know, uh, go ahead and get back to the work at hand. Tend my lambs, feed my sheep, and continue in the work of the ministry." In fourteen, chapter fourteen, verses one to four. Jesus speaks tender words of comfort and consolation, not only to Peter, but all those who were in earshot of him. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and in me. Don't be overcome by fear or uncertainty or doubt because you got to think that in, in this situation, uh, uh, they were saying that, hey, Jesus is going. Where is he going? Why can't we follow? And yet, you know, uh, we've been with him the last three years and, you know, uh, what are we going to do? What, what, what about these uncertain times? What about the doubt that we feel? And um, even as the disciples felt these range of emotions, guys, you can identify with many of the same questions and concerns, uh, even fears we face. You know, we, we take it from, uh, in our heart that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. We take it that uh, He is with us through, through, through these, these hard times. But you know, uh, uh, we have other things that can bring question or concern. We can have other things that really make us fearful. Hey, we're fearful of the unknown. We're fearful of what the future holds. We're fearful of the economy. We're fearful because hey, maybe our loved ones, they're not going in the right path. They're not going the right way. But even fears uh, we face in our own individual lives, each one unique to our own personal situation. 
I go preparing a place before you, he says, a place for all eternity. Can we believe that he goes before us today, day by day, step by step? How are we going to do it? You might ask yourself. You might have that question. You might have that doubt. How can we manage? Do I have the energy? Do I have the strength? Do I have the stamina? Do, do, do I have the finances or the faith to go on trusting Him? Or, you know, do we panic? Do we make it on our own way? Do we begin uh, to look for other ways outside of trusting Jesus to make things work, to make things happen? See, we like human beings. We like to fix problems. We like to solve problems. And we can kind of say to ourselves that, hey, uh, I, I can do this. I can do that. You know, I can sell my soul to the company store or whatever it might be. But uh, all, all hard questions that check us, you know, check our hearts, check our motive, check our intents, and check our relationship. Hey, where are we with the Lord? Are we really trusting Him during this tough time? Are we really trusting Him as, you know, somebody else goes through this time of difficulty? A lot of times, you know, when it's for ourselves, we can kind of tough it on and we say, Lord, I'm just trusting in You. But when we see others going through different things, we can kind of feel like, oh, helpless, and, and uh, we feel it even worse. And sometimes what, what really blows my mind is the person going through that trial or going through that circumstance has more faith than I. You know, they, 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 they end up, as you try to comfort them, they end up comforting you because they're filled with faith that God will deliver them. God will bring them through the time of difficulty, whatever it might be. Like, uh, like, like we heard from the pulpit today, you might be on a uh, mountaintop type of experience, but know that sometimes when we come off those great highs, those great victories, those, those great triumphs, the enemy is right around the corner. As we turn the corner, it seems like he blindsides us. You know, he smacks us right in the face with that flat side of the shovel and, hey, down we go. And, 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 and uh, we are on the ropes again. But, you know, uh, he says, and, and, in, and all this, and you know the way where I'm going, he tells them. He says, you know already you know in your hearts that you know where I'm going you know this you know and and to which Thomas quips Lord we do not know where the way uh, the way you're going how do we know the way he asked and you know we, we've coined the, 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 the names of doubting Thomas impetuous Peter but when you look at the lives of these guys when you do a little history check and a fact check and so on you can see that these guys through the times of uh, very much immaturity and stability, lacking faith, lacking trust, they really grew and matured to these uh, great men of God. And God is calling us, you know, as we might be young in the faith, as we might have not grown too much, we may have known the Lord for many years, but we haven't grown that much. But God is bringing us to that place of maturing us, setting us apart more and more through the times of difficulty, setting us apart more and more as he shows himself faithful, uh, taking us through situations day by day. He says, you know the way I'm going, you know, and, and uh, to which Thomas goes, Lord, we do not know the way. How do we know the way? And we sang it this morning, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, he answered. I am the only way, he says, Thomas. Every step of the way, I'm with you guys. Don't worry. And I'm not telling you everything now. In, in the next few verses, he's going to lay out uh, things on prayer. He's going to lay out things of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he'll lay out more and more. And, and for our lives at times, sometimes we like to have the roadmap. We like to have the next three years planned. We like to say that, hey, I'm going to be okay. The business world is going to be okay. Our investments are doing th this or that. Or... My health is going to stay good so we can continue. I'll still have a job, blah, blah, blah. But he says, hey, I'm the way, uh, Thomas, every step of the way, day by day. You know, he, he, he told uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, he, he writes to one of the tribes of uh, Israel, one of the sons of Israel. He, he really just says, hey, I give you strength for the day. So my strength is so your day will be. In other words, I give you strength not for the next three years or five years or ten years but day by day I give you the strength day by day I take you by the hand and lead you and guide you in that way and now from Peter to Thomas we see Philip jump in let's uh, pick up our study here in verse 8 of chapter 14 Philip said to him Lord show us the father and it is enough for us and uh, 
uh, just show us the Father, Philip says, and you know, it will be enough for us to believe. And, and, and uh, Jesus uh, uh, said to him, have I not so uh, uh, been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has sent me has seen the Father. How do you say, show, uh, show us the Father? Jesus quickly replies here, have you not come to know me yet, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And Philip, as we know, uh, Philip, as, as you know me and have seen me, you have seen the Father. The emphasis is on that word know, guys. Philip, as you know me, you have seen the Father. And uh, in John, uh, John 12, 45, Jesus speaking, says that he who beholds me, beholds the one who sent me. In other words, as you behold me, as you see me, as you gaze upon me, you see the one, the Father who has sent me into this world. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. And here Jesus asserts his claim to be God. What he's saying is, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. And uh, here in verse uh, 9, Philip You've come to know me. And then it's really simple. I have a whole bunch of periods at the end of that. Philip, you've come to know me. You've come to realize with me. Maybe in your heart and your mind, you cannot put it all together at this particular time, particular point in time. But you do know me. Uh, if the word believe is used some 99 times in John's Gospel, remember we've been talking about that, the word believe or believed. Well, believers is used some 99 times in the John's Gospel. The word know is used some 140 different times. <clears throat> Philip, you've come to know me. Philip, you know me. Philip, you know me. And there are different levels of knowing uh, that exist, guys. You can say, I know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I know that if I drive too fast, I'll get a speeding ticket. I know that I love hot fudd sundaes. Do you guys know that? You love the hot fudd sundaes. You go to McDonald's, say, give me one of those dollar hot fudd sundaes, you know. <laughs> Simple facts like this, you know. But the truth of the facts, knowing the truth of the facts is, I know if I eat too many hot fudd sundaes, I'll gain weight, I'll get fatter than I already am. <laughs> you know that. And the truth of the fact is that, hey, too many hot fun Sundays are not good for you. I know that if I get that speeding ticket, I'll have to pay a big fine and my insurance will probably go up too. I know this. Here's the truth behind the fact uh, of speeding. To know on a deeper level may speak of an intimate relationship as with a husband and a wife. Hey, you know, uh, the knowledge of a husband and wife, hey, you, you have a lot of knowledge that hey, other people might not know. Not even your kids, because what, what is uh, intimate with, within the marriage relationship is between a man and a woman, and hopefully it's between, uh, with God right in between. You know, a, a cord of three strands is not easily broken, the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And you know, it was Solomon, and he was a wise man. He says what he was saying, that is, uh, if, if the Lord is in the mix of your marriage, hey, you're not easily going to be broken. Uh, uh, and, and within this marriage relationship, the husband and wife relationship, comes a, a, a keen knowledge of one another. And, uh, uh, and this is one level of uh, a deeper relationship between a husband and a wife. But here, to know the Lord, it's an even uh, more intimate and more deeper level of fellowship and communion. An intimacy that should exceed any earthly relationship. There's no one else who's closer to, to you than the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. It would exceed every earthly relationship. How do you get to know someone, guys? How did you get to know your friend or your, um, uh, your wife or whatever it might be? It's spending time with them. No, no different from knowing God. It's, it, it's simple bottom line truth is the amount of time we spend with Him, the amount of times that we, uh, things that we share with Him, those close intimate thoughts, and the things that, you know, speak, speak to us. A lot of guys, they have journals, they have notebooks as they read through the Bible, as they're praying. What they're doing is that they, they, they're writing what God might be speaking to their heart. You might be like me, you might have your highlight, you might have your, your sharp pencil or, uh, or pen that you're writing in the margins, you're writing little notes, you're writing other scripture references in the in the 
uh, confine of your Bible, or you're doing little drawings, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, you you uh, you have uh, uh, God speaking to you, and you know, as as you read through the Word of God, God is reading to you His life into you and His knowledge into you. How do you get to know someone by spending time with them? No, uh, no different again from knowing God. We had the blessing, Lavon and I, to get together with another couple who's related to one of our um, um, one of our pastors, one of our church family in Japan, and, and uh, you know we we had been out with them kind of a couple of times, but you know it's kind of stiff. But this time it was something different. That after that that we ate, and you know it was good. The food was so so, but the laughter and the fellowship was even better as we. We talked, we laughed, we talked, we laughed. We ate too many nachos and all this and that. But you know, uh, uh, the talking and laughter and the sharing of one another was something that was just so fabulous. Three hours later, you know, we, we shared a little dessert, uh, one dish, four spoons, and everybody said, nah, 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 I, I'm full, I'm not hungry. And then everybody took one bite, and then all of a sudden I heard clash, clash, clash. I heard the spoons clanging against the plate. And I said, wow, for a bunch of guys that wasn't hungry. You know, four spoons digging into that one dessert, the thing disappeared real quick until the very last bite. Oh, no, you have no, 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 no. <laughs> so that one bite <laughs> lasted. But four spoons, one plate, and it said that hey, there was a sharing of... Um, of communion, of fellowship. And I think that that's, that's something that's fun, it's good, hey, we're reaching out to this family, but yet uh, the thing was, hey, hey, how, do we, how do we relate to the Lord? How do we attain that intimacy and that fellowship? How do we get that thing that hey, we're sharing that last, you know, that, that one dessert with him and two spoons, you know? And, and uh, uh, again, it's spending time with him in the Word, spending time with him in fellowship with other believers in worship. But I really believe the Word really becomes that, that lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. God reveals to us his love and his devotion for us. 10 to 12 and 14, uh, do you not believe I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding me does his works. Believe in me, and I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on the, the account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me the works, what I shall do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Uh, Philip the Lord says, all that I say and do is not on my own doing, but the Father who is working in and through me. Uh, Paul would uh, have would take the same very thought as he wrote to the Colossian church saying, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. The Lord, uh, the word image or icon says he's absolutely a perfect expression and representation of God the Father. Christ being the visible rep representation and manifestation of God to all created beings. You know, the guys had the benefit, they walk with Jesus, they talk with Jesus, they saw Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus was that exact rep representation of the invisible God who was in heaven, guys. In the verses we have looked at so far in chapters 13 and 14, we seem to know the most about Peter, some of Thomas, and a little of Philip. And I hope to take you through a little excursion to the lives of these guys, especially Peter, um, uh, later on, maybe uh, next week or so. But yet what we do see here is a deep desire to know within Philip's heart, to know the Father. See, Philip, Philip, Philip had a genuine desire. Hey, I want to know the Heavenly Father, Lord. I want to, I want to know it. Maybe there was not so much doubt or so much question, but he says that, hey, I really want to know the Father. He's come a long way from the early days in Galilee. He probably was one of the rough, tough guys on the waterfront, now having walked with Jesus for some three and a half years to a place of pressing into a deeper relationship as he sought more knowledge of the Father to know him even better. He says, hey Lord, I got to know you even more. I want to know you even more. And, and, and uh, this is the thing, I need to know you more better. Uh, more better, why? I don't think uh, uh, pigeon English was the strong suit of the word here. 
Ei luoda lehtyä noudat varmoa verran. But you know, that was the thought, that was the feeling in the heart of Philip. And for us today, we haven't seen Jesus in the flesh, but we do see him in his words and his, his works through the word of God, guys, through the word of God. The word of God becomes a, a that historical uh, outlook of, of the words and works of Jesus Christ. Our Bibles become the testimony of what he's done and reveals for us the heart of the Father, the heart of the Father. One of our missionaries to China, he used to, he used to, uh, he came back from China one year and he, he was so in, uh, uh, on this thing of hey, what, what the Father is doing, what the Father is doing. And I really believe that hey, he had just come through a heavy study of the Gospel of John. And, and, uh, and he was saying, hey, this is what the Father is doing, Russell. This is what the Father is doing in China. This is what the Father is doing in the people. And this is what the Father is doing in my heart and in my life. And as, as he drew closer to Jesus Christ, the heart of the Father was revealed to him in an even greater way and an even more intimate level. Let, let's read from 12 to 15 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I shall do uh, also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, in verse 12, the words of Jesus speaks of greater works or greater things. And I believe that they apply to the church. You know, some say that they apply to the apostles because the apostles had the gifts of the working of, workings of miracle and raising people from the dead and so on and so forth. But I do believe right across the board, they apply to the church then and they apply to the church today that these greater works we will, we will do uh, in the name of Jesus and on behalf of the Father, guys, as we become his representatives here in this world. They apply to the church, the body of Christ, will be soon filled with power from on high. You know, in the next few verses, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to send you the helper, the comfort, the, hope, the Holy Spirit. You know, he's going to make that way for you. You'll see it in the next uh, upcoming verses as Jesus does lay this very thing out. But here in verses 13 and 14, we have the encouragement in the privilege of prayer. We have the encouragement in the privilege of prayer. I, I love it. Um, we pray, and uh, uh, some of you guys remember Dougie Nakano, Douglas Nakano. He calls me up yesterday, so I said, oh, I'm so glad you called, Dougie, because last time I saw you, I didn't get your cell phone number. Now I'm going to plug it into my telephone book and my phone. But he says, hey, pray for me. Uh, he said, Pastor, I'm waiting for you. I, I'm looking down the hallway. I'm waiting for you to turn the corner from the elevator because I'm looking for you to come walking down the hallway. <laughs> because his, uh, his room, he looks right out the door sometimes. And, and, and uh, he sees me coming, so he lets out a big yell, hey, Russell, hey, Pastor, you know. The whole wing can hear it, you know, as, as he says. He's so excited to have a visitor, to have a guest. And, and uh, uh, but he says, hey, pray, pray for me. So, you know, this morning the guys gather, we pray for Dougie. And, of course, we pray for you, Dougie. And uh, uh, here again, we're lifting you up. And, you know, the, the privilege we have in prayer uh, is, is such a great joy. And so much times we, we bear so much grief and so much burden because we fail to take all things to God in prayer. And sometimes, you know, uh, granted, we take that prayer request back. After receiving some peace, we say, hey, Lord, I want to worry about it. Let me take that worry back. I want to worry about it. I want to be concerned about it. And yet God says, hey, give it, give it all to me in prayer. Bring it all to me in prayer. Don't take this needless sorrow, this needless pain, but take it all. Bring it all to me in prayer. Lay it down at the foot of my cross. Jesus, uh, 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 we see the excesses, you know, not only that, but you know, in the, in the body of Christ, it's unfortunately unfortunate that we see excesses and abuses with people's concepts or misconceptions in prayer. Do we pray in the name of Jesus? Yes, we do. Most of us Christians, we pray in the name of Jesus. Yet the name of Jesus does not translate to a pat formula for answer to prayer. Hey, I prayed in the name of Jesus. Hey, God, how come I never hit that lottery? 
<laughs> you see what's in my heart? I'm still thinking about the lottery. I said, I don't gamble, but I'm still thinking about the lottery. <laughs> I prayed in the name of Jesus, Father. What's up with that? I still didn't hit that lottery. But that's what guys, you know, can conceive Jesus to be at times. It's like letting the genie out of the bottle and having your wishes and your requests all granted. Hey, the name of Jesus, okay, yeah, whatever you like. God will answer us as he wills, you know, as a matter of fact. But, you know, uh, the thing is that does it bring him glory? Does it bring glory, glory to his name? And many times we pray for good things. We pray for good things. We don't know. We don't know him, but we ask, uh, we, uh, uh, we ask for healing and salvation uh, to help those uh, with, with knowing him. We pray for salvation. We pray for healing. You gotta watch out. Sometimes you pray for healing, the person dies. Oh man, you know, you feel convicted. Hey, is that is that an answer to prayer? Yeah, it might be an answer to prayer. But you know, God, God is God is so faithful, God is so good, He hears those prayers. And sometimes we don't understand why He answers that way. Sometimes we don't understand. I'm praying for something good, I'm praying for salvation for that loved one or for that person at work or whoever it might be. We, we, we see all the injustices in the world. We ask, oh Lord, you help those people who are starving, who are being brutalized by these bad people. Yet God, get, God answers and works as he will in his time and for his glory. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we just can't figure it out. Sometimes he answers immediately. Sometimes he answers those hard ones. Sometimes he answers those uh, very difficult prayers. And sometimes it's, it's kind of wait and trust me that I'm working, that I'm, uh, uh, I'm moving on behalf of this situation. Or, or can you accept that it's a no in this situation? Philippians 1, uh, 3 to 26, you know, I was just trying to look for, for some examples of prayer, and I found some good ones in Philippians 1, verses 3 to 26. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he's already in prison. Uh, the, the Roman government had thrown him into prison, and, and he says, I thank my God for all my remembrance of you and always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you. Here he is, he's in prayer. He's praying for the brothers and sisters at the church at Philippi. And that's a great thing, yeah? Can you think about that? He's suffering, he's the one that lost his freedom. He's incarcerated, he's probably eating the stale bread and the, the fall water and all this. But he says, I, I, I offer prayer with joy in my uh, prayer for all you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the verse day until now, I am confident of this very good thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you think that some of the guys in the church at Philippi were upset, very upset that their beloved Paul, who had helped them begin their church, who had helped uh, encourage them along, and now he's telling them this, I am confident of this very thing, even though I'm here in prison, I'm confident of this, confident of this that he who began that good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That word perfect is simply to complete, to accomplish, completion, finish, perfect it. And you know, God is doing that ongoing work in you, that he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, until we go to be with Jesus Christ, he's still working on us that work to make us complete and to accomplish His perfect will, His perfect purposes in us. And even as we go through times that, hey, Paul didn't get released yet. God didn't answer my prayer. I, I prayed in the name of Jesus. What's up with that? But you know, he says, well, the, it's the only way for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partic partakers of grace with me. See, Paul says, hey, I'm the one uh, going through this, in, in, uh, in this imprisonment through this hard time, but we all partake the grace of God in and through this situation. It's like your brother or sister going through a hard time. Oh, oh man, I heard you lost your job. I really feel it. Oh, I heard you lost your, your this or your that. 
you know, I really feel for you. And, you know, we, we all go through it because of the love that God has given us one for another. But he says, for God is my witness, how I long for you with the, all the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may still abound more and more in, in real knowledge and in all discernment. Here again was the guy that you probably think, yeah, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. But he's reminding them that uh, in just, just these short few verses, yeah, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. I'm in prison, but I'm here. I have this great joy to pray for you guys that you're, you might abound with all discernment, with all knowledge, that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless in the day of Christ Jesus. What a prayer is that, yeah? He says that, you know, you might approve the things that are excellent. And you know, a lot of times we might know, not know what is excellent or what is not so excellent. When we were kids, we loved, before they used to have those letter grades, uh, and we love to see the E, uh, which stood for excellent, excellent work and all this and that. And uh, you, you like to think that you would be doing excellent work, but he's saying that you might approve the things that are excellent. In all our ways, we're making choices day by day in this world. We're making choices, hey, what would be a blessing to Jesus? What would glorify his name? Or at times, unfortunately, we might make those choices uh, that are not so excellent, you know. You try to be good, yeah. You walk into 7-Eleven, you're going for the spam musubi, but then the big green apple jumps out at you right as you walk past the counter. What choice do I make? Do I make the choice for the spam musubi, or do, do I go for the apple? And try and be good, try and make a good choice. Well, Paul is saying that, hey, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys have know these excellent choices that God has already made for you, and you follow along with them. He says, for God, uh, uh, he says, uh, it is only right for me that I, uh, well, well, God is my witness how I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that your love may still abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment. Again, he's praying. Again, can you think that, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, a lot of the prayers that our loved ones pray years ago, years before, they're still being answered today. God still knows those prayers. And they might be those that have gone home to be with the Lord. They might have been loved ones. They might have been our kupunas, our elders, that were praying for us when we were little kids, or when we were kids, not so little, maybe kids in our minds. But we were making those bad choices. And, 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 and yet they were praying for us and those prayers are still being answered even though they might not be here with us. Even though we've come, uh, they may have moved away, you know, out of this realm, whatever it might be, God is still hearing those prayers that we might uh, approve those things. I haven't been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment came uh, in the cause of Christ has become more and more well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and through everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some for sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do out of love, knowing that I am, point, uh, I am appointed to the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in the pretense of truth, Christ is being proclaimed. In this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. You know, some within the body of Christ, uh, they, they were preaching uh, Christ out of wrong motives. They were asking for wrong things, whatever it might be. But he says the, the main thing is that Jesus Christ is in, being proclaimed. In this I rejoice. And I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You know, he's thanking them. Hey, guys, you know, I know that I'm going to be delivered because of the prayers of the saints. And Paul would be delivered. He would uh, be set free from prison. We know that uh, uh, he anticipated this, as we see in 1 Timothy. But we know that after he was released for a certain period of time, he was thrown back into prison. And we know at 2 Timothy, which was his last book, 
He says that in the sentence of death is hanging over my head. Yeah, God answered the prayers. I got released. I got to see you guys. I got to spend time. I got to walk as a free man. But here I am back in prison, ready to be poured out as a drink offering on, on behalf of the Lord. Yeah, the great persecution had begun. Caesar Nero was that crazy wild man in Rome blaming the Christians for burning Rome. And yet there was really a reason for him to persecute the Christians. He says, according to my earnest expectation of hope, I shall not be put to shame in anything, and that with boldness Christ shall uh, even now as expected be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, Paul says in uh, either way, Jesus Christ will be exalted through this difficult time that I go through. Whether I live or die, uh, 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 it, it is, you know, for me to live, he says, is Christ, to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor to me. I do not know which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. And that is much better. Yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your faith. He says, hey, it's a good thing to be with the Lord, but I think that I can do even more on your behalf if I'm still around, if I can still come alongside, if I can still speak words of encouragement, if I can still be used to pray. He says, I'm convinced of this. I know that I shall remain. He says, I know I shall remain. I know that, you know, this is going to happen. And continue with you for all, for your uh, for you all, for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul was kind of greedy. He says, I want to, you know, I want to share because I want to see the blessing of your progress as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and being filled with joy in the faith uh, of, of Christ, guys, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to see you again. Paul looked forward with all anticipation that there are, there, um, their prayers would be answered and that he would return to them. That he did. And uh, yet at times uh, we see that things, things uh, don't go exactly as we expect. Acts chapter 12, we're going to conclude here. And then we'll get on uh, next week with the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts 12 uh, verse 1 says that now that time heard the king had hands on some who belong to the church in order to mistreat them. Uh, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized them, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the uh, Passover to bring him up before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being fervently, uh, made fervently by the church to God. And here we see hey, hey, the guys are asking for prayer. Same like Paul, the church is praying for Peter now. And now on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. It was just like at the cusp of Peter being turned over to those Jews who wanted to probably kill him. <laughs> Peter was sleeping between the two guards, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter's side and roused him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. He did so and said to him, Wrap your cloak around uh, you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. He did not know. Uh, what was being done by the angel, if, if what was being done was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when he had passed through the first and second guard, he came to the front gate, which leads to the city, and opened them, uh, 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 and opened for them by itself, and went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Guys, sometimes the angel of God, the messengers of God come, and they bring a word of encouragement, they bring a word of hope. They bring us away, they're showing us, hey, this is the way out of this dark place. And sometimes, you know, um, we can have dreams or vision, you know, uh, I don't know if it was the pizza that you, you had or I had or whatever it might be, but sometimes you can almost literally see, and people might be in a dark place. People are entering into a dark uh, area. 
and, and uh, sometimes in, after much prayer, you might want to mention to that person, hey, I see you entering into this place that you ought not to be. You speak a word of encouragement. You speak a word of exhortation. You speak a word that says, hey, you're going to correct the, the path of your foot. Uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, when he had passed the first and second guard, he came and Peter, uh, Peter said to himself, the Lord has sent forth his angel, verse 11, and rescued me from the hand of Herod, from all the Jewish people were expecting. And when he had realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where they were gathered around and were praying. You know, the whole focus is a pray, praying in the name of Jesus. What, what happens? He knocked on the door of the gate. A servant girl named uh, Ron, Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter, Peter's voice because of her joy, did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. Unbelievable. She was so excited. She just ran with zeal. Forget it. I'm not letting you in. I'm just going to go tell the guys. And when they said to her, you are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is an angel. See, they were praying for Peter, but really, they didn't believe that Peter could be there. They said, nah, no way. Peter is not getting away. He's not getting out. But Peter continued knocking, and when he opened the door, they saw him were amazed, and he motioned to them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had led him out of prison, and said, report these things to James and the brethren. And uh, he departed and went to another, uh, another place. Here's a miraculous answer to prayer, guys. And I don't know why, I don't know why uh, James, the, I know the church was probably praying for James, but James was beheaded. I don't know why Paul was released for just a short period of time, thrown back into jail, and then beheaded by the Roman, uh, by the Roman government, he couldn't be crucified because remember Paul was a Roman citizen, so crucifixion was not allowed for a Roman citizen because it was such a heinous, cruel death. So they beheaded Paul, and yet here with Peter, Peter was let out of jail. He was. Uh, set free from that sentence of death because surely the Jewish leaders would want to, wanted to have killed him. But yet, Peter, soon after the death of Paul, too, in Rome, was crucified upside down, uh, martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that any of this will happen to us, but sometimes in prayer, uh, God's perfect will will be done. God will move. God will minister. God will set free. God will heal. Yes, guys. But God will answer prayer uh, all to his glory and un all to his perfect will. Um, I go back to one of my friends from one, one of the guys um, from on the waterfront. Uh, he had received the Lord, but yet he was so defeated because he couldn't shake his addictions. He couldn't shake the things that were holding him to him. He lived a life of defeat. He was so defeated, so uh, distressed, and so despondent. He wanted to give everything up. He wanted to uh, uh, quit his job, everything, you know, and uh, things just didn't go right. Uh, Things started to turn around. He got into a new home. He got back uh, into work after a little while. But then what surfaced was an old charge that came up against him. Uh, and he was incarcerated. Uh, uh, no way getting out of that. And he says, hey, I'm just getting my life back together with the Lord and now I'm gonna lose everything. I'm gonna lose my house, I'm gonna probably lose my family. Maybe my job might be waiting for me after that, but everything else, all the money we put into it, it's all gonna be gone. He went into jail, his testimony is this, that he went in for six months, he read through the Bible five times in six months. He came out a man transformed. I, I'm still amazed at the testimony of this man and how his life was taken from defeat now to victory, now to pressing in with the things of the Lord, now to walking with him, now in fellowship with the Lord. Now as Philip would say, hey, I, I, I've, I've grown to know the Father and the Son in an even greater way because in the intimacy of my 
by himself, you know, I, I, they came and they revealed themselves to me. I, I don't know, I cannot explain why uh, God miraculously brought him out. Uh, he was able to somehow, uh, the Lord made that way. He, he suspended the payments on his home, I believe, for six months and came out, went back to work and was able to just kind of pick up where he left off after going in. Sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain, I know it was a tremendous time of trepidation and fear for him, yet God having his way and his will delivered him through that and brought him uh, a man transformed by the renewing of his mind. He no longer conformed to the ways of the world, but transformed by the, the renewing of the mind through the reading, through the study, through the revelation of Jesus Christ, through the Word of God. Guys, so you know, as as we as we know God by knowing His Word, guys, it's really true. And if if we counted the Word again, know through the Gospel of John, we're going to say that it, Jesus really wanted to know uh, for us to know Him and to know the Father. Let's pray, Father God. We do want to